Hi folks, it's Dr Paul Rose again and I'm here with another Animal Management Practical and this time we've got a very special guest speaker. This is my dad, Alan, um, and he's been keeping fish for a very long time and he's going to talk to you a bit about the importance of husbandry and management for a very special setup of Aquaria, uh, which is the Saltwater Tropical Marine Fish Tank. So thanks for coming along to talk to the students. Um, my first question then, how long have you been keeping marine fish for? Well, I've been keeping marine fish for approximately 50 years, um, more or less full time. A couple of breaks um, during that time when I was at uh, college myself, but otherwise I've always had a tank of some sort. And have you seen anything change in the types of species that you can get for your marine tank? Um, not particularly, I mean the fish we could get then you probably find it's easier to get fish now than it was 50 years ago, um, but the sort of fish that are around are much and much the same. And have you seen more captively bred fish now than in the past? That is what's happening more and more now. Um, it's obviously not the best thing to do to take uh, wild fish from the ocean. Um, and we are now starting to get a lot more things like the clownfish and the, and the damsels that are bred in captivity. Um, I think sometimes the downside of that is some of the captively bred ones don't have quite the colour of the wild fish. Lovely stuff. So because you've kept both tropical and marine aquaria, what's the sort of major difference between the two from a daily management perspective? Well obviously a marine tank is, is salt water and when um, a warm tank in a cold room, it basically the water does evaporate and when that evaporation it's only the, the water that goes, the salt stays in the tank. So over a period of, of time the salinity of the, of the water will go up. So one of the main things, the, the main thing really that's different is that you have to keep an eye on the salinity level um, within the tank and make sure that you keep the, the specific gravity at the right level. And when you put the salt in the water, is that special or is it just your table salt? Uh, no, you have to have a, a, a proper mix of salt, which is not just pure salt as in table salt, but it has lots of other sort of uh, chemicals in amongst it. Um, so you have to buy the specific salt. Um, obviously, it's even better if you can actually go and get real seawater, but uh, that's not always easy to do. So how do you go about mixing the salt water into the fish tank? What do you have to be aware of? What's your like key parameters to measure when you're making the okay. oh, so I suppose it is artificial. It is artificial, water. but you're trying to make it as close to natural salt water as you possibly can. What you have to start with is perfectly pure water. And the best way to do that is by using um, RO water, which is reverse osmosis water, which is where your tap water is passed over a very fine uh, filter under pressure um, so that all that can go through is the pure H2O and that's so you end up with what is effectively the equivalent of distilled water and then you mix the salt mix at the right concentration into that water so that you get the correct salinity for the fish. Um, with a lot of the modern mixes of salt you can actually use that once it's been sort of stood for a couple of hours but I personally prefer to leave it for a few days to make sure it's all nice and dispersed. So when you look at mixing the salt water together, how do you know how much to use? Okay, well I know from experience that if I have 10 litres of uh, RO water, I then have to add 350 grams of my salt mix and that gives me the correct uh, 1022 specific gravity for the tank. And what's that particular term then? Uh, what do the numbers mean and what is specific gravity? Well specific gravity really is, a, is, is the weight of the water because obviously compared to fresh water when you add salt to the water it makes it heavier so the specific gravity goes up so it goes from one which I suppose is fresh water to 1022 which is the salt water. Obviously as the water evaporates the salinity gets higher. Uh, when you get too high it actually is uh, it will kill the fish so you've got to keep it at the right level. And have you got any equipment that helps with the measurement of that? Well yes I have an implement here which is a device that basically just floats in the water 
and it measures exactly what the um, specific gravity of the water is because obviously the denser the water the more salt in the water the higher up it floats in the water same as being on if you go to somewhere like the Dead Sea which has got a lot of salt in it you can float on top of the water you won't sink and that's just because of the amount of salt in the water so this will float higher in the water when the salt is denser so you have to keep it somewhere in the green areas like I don't know if you can see the green area marked yeah, on there green, right? but it's that's basically 1020 1022 which is the level you need for the marine fish so do you put that in the fish tank itself or do you take a sample of the fish tank's water no that's fine as long as you keep that clean you can float it in the fish tank and take a reading lovely so I think one of the things that folks that have kept tropical fish might be familiar with is that if you see tropical freshwater fish in a fish tank there's a lot of them yeah but in the fish tank behind you you've got four fish yeah so why is the stocking density so much different basically salt water doesn't hold as much oxygen as fresh water does so consequently you can't have so many fish in the same size tank because there's not the oxygen there to feed the fish to keep them going also marine fish tend to be somewhat bulkier um, than freshwater fish so they for the same sort of number of fish it's actually more body of fish taking up more of the oxygen out of the water and if folks Sorry. have been to like a big public aquarium mm -hmm. and they've seen one of those enormous reef displays which is jam-packed full of marine fish yeah. what's the difference between that kind of setup and what you've got going on here well obviously if you've got a larger volume of water everything is more stable everything evens out and you'll probably find at the end of the day they've, they've also got a, a large sump of water that you can't see that is being fil filtered and passed through the main tank the main viewing tank so the overall capacity of the tank is probably in, in, in similar terms percentage wise the same as what you have with a little tank in your house and for those that are not familiar with the term sump what's right. one of them a sump is just a large container that can that holds a, a, an amount of water a lot of people in their houses with their own fish tanks will also have a smaller sump underneath the tank um, but I don't have one here okay lovely so in terms of actually looking after the fish that's very similar to what you would do with tropical fresh water themselves there isn't much in the way of any difference really obviously you've got to make sure that when you top up the water you top it up with the right strength of salt water also during the course of a week the the water in your fish tank evaporates and you'll, you'll have probably seen when you go into shops that the water level in the tank has come down from the top there because of evaporation um, obviously that evaporation is just pure water there's none of the salt have evaporated so if you were to just keep putting the salt mix in over time the salt concentration in your tank would go up and up and up to the point where it would kill the fish what I've got in my tank here it's not very clear to see but in the corner of the tank a part of the fish tank is actually cordoned off and sealed so that the water flows into it from the tank what that means is that when the water evaporates it only drops in the box in the corner the tank level here always stays the same and when I top it up I just top up with fresh RO water without any salt to bring the level in the box back up to the top of the tank and I do that about once a week if it's a really hot day it might come down a bit quicker therefore you might have to do it a little bit more frequently and does the strength of the lighting affect the temperature of the fish tank because I guess with a lot of marine systems you have quite powerful lighting that used to be a problem a few years ago when you used to have to use high powered lights that were very heat intensive lights nowadays with um, leds you can get the strength of the light without any heat so it's less of a problem there on the tank here we have a bit of a mixture of both fluorescent lights which are quite hot and leds which aren't so it's not too bad and i know um, some people that are eagle-eyed might have picked up there's not just fish in the tank there's also some sea anemones um, 
And is that the reason for the importance of the lighting to keep the sea anemones healthy? Well, sea anemones, um, they have got algae growing with, within them symbiotically. So, and that feeds the sea anemone more than anything. I very rarely have to put any food in the sea anemones. The fish sometimes give them some food and they occasionally catch their own bits, but the bulk of their food seems to come from the, the algae that lives within their tentacles. So if you see a white sea anemone, invariably it's lost all its algae and is probably not going to survive. And that, folks, for those of you that like animal behaviour, is an interesting symbiotic relationship because most people, thanks to Disney and Finding Nemo, are familiar with the symbiotic relationship of the clownfish and the anemone. But the anemone symbiotic relationship with the algae that lives within its tentacles are one of the key things that keep it alive. And the clownfish is responsible for aerating and cleaning the anemone. So that's the benefit that the anemone gets of living with the clownfish. So the last kind of question about the sort of actual infrastructure of the tank before we talk a bit more about the animals then is you don't have any actual filtration in this tank itself. How do you keep the water so clean? Right. OK, that's true. There is no artificial outside mechanical filtration for the tank. The tank is actually basically a chunk of reef. It's all the rock in here is what they call living rock. It's actually been most of it is actually manufactured rock. It's basically concrete, uh, rough concrete that has actually been in the seawater as a reef in the tropics. And it's probably in the water for about four years before it's harvested. It is then kept in the same way as you keep a live fish. It has to be kept in water, transported in water, because inside all that rock is all the live bacteria, all the live microscopic organisms, all of which produce the filtration for the fish tank. So this fish tank is actually filtered by the rock. Which is quite interesting stuff because if you put live rock in a fish tank you'll find all kind of weird and wonderful animals that come out of it. When you first put them in you get all sorts of animals come out of it. Some of which are nice to have, some of which are not so nice as Paul can tell you about what we found in there a few years ago. Yeah you can get some very large uh, bristle worms that come out of the live rock and they can be enormous in length um, and we found a very very large bristle worm that meant the tank had to be taken apart, this bristle worm removed, because they're not only predatory on the fish, but they're also toxic if you touch them um, to get rid of it, because that was something that we really didn't want living in the fish tank. So it's a biological filtration within the tank itself. And so long as your tank is mature, you know what you're doing, and you do regular water changes with reverse osmosis water, and you have a low stocking density of fish, you can get away with a natural system. If you had a big public aquaria with a higher stocking density, you would need some help with that filtration. Okay, so we're going to look at the live rock in a bit more detail. So, Alan, would you like to point out the big piece of live rock at the back and why it's covered in all of that red crusty stuff? Okay. At the back there, you've got that tall piece of rock. It's actually um, an artificial piece of rock produced using concrete, a, a rough mixed concrete that's been left soaking in, in, the, in the reef somewhere. In the tank here, what you can now see on it, that since it's been put in the tank, you've got all the red stuff that's growing on there. That's a coralline algae that's growing. Um, basically, that's a natural growth which occurs in the wild. And it's, it's part of really the natural biological filtration for the tank. It keeps everything um, nice and clean uh, and makes a natural environment for the fish. Um, you've also got the bit of algae that's growing on there. Um, again, that's natural. If we had a fish in here, which unfortunately I haven't anymore, that actually eats the algae, they would be making good use of that. Yeah. You can also see that there's, uh, there's some orange ones there. That's again, is another natural growth. And there's various other pieces within the tank of various bits of, of uh, uh, tube worms, and, and bits of sponge and things that are growing in there, all yeah. of which is natural. And you've got the whole of the back is covered in that coralline algae, yes. which uh, shows the water quality is kept at a good parameter. And then there's also a couple of little hermit crabs knocking around in there as well, which you're not going to be able to find. They're in there somewhere. They also help with the biological uh, recycling of all of the fish waste and everything. 
So how did you decide upon the mixture of fish in the tank? So we've got a pair of clownfish. So Mrs. Clownfish is the big one. And then I can't see Mr. Clownfish, but he's much smaller. Oh, he's right in the sea anemone. Then there's a chromis, which is the pale uh, blue fish. And then there is a small damselfish that is dark blue and yellow. What is it about this mix of fish that means they exist so well together? Uh, well, basically, they're all roughly the same sort of size. They all come from the same uh, environment. Uh, they're not particularly aggressive to each other, although mm, they like their own bit of territory. They will defend their little territory. Um, and they don't go round eating all the small bits and pieces off the reef as well, which is good. And that's one of the things that you should think about when you put together a community tank, because even though this is a marine aquarium, it's still a community tank. And the natural habits of the fish themselves, particularly how they eat, will determine how much competition there is in the fish tank. So here is Mrs. Clownfish. She's, as we said, much larger than her mate, and she's also darker in colour. This species of clownfish is the common clownfish, although it's relatively indistinguishable from the pecula clownfish. The distinguishing feature of the different species are the number of spines in their pectoral fins. We haven't got that close to count them. So we're going to say that they're common clownfish, one of the most popular of all marine aquarium fish. Clownfish live for a very long time. My dad has had this pair in this fish tank since it was set up around about a decade ago. They're relatively robust, easy to look after, and they always do best if they've got an anemone. And here is Mr. Clownfish. He's much smaller and much brighter in colour. Clownfish have an unusual life history. When they hatch, they all hatch as males. The largest fish in the shoal becomes a female, selects a partner and goes to find a territory. In some species of clownfish, they exist in family groups, but there's only ever one large female fish who's in control of reproduction. The clownfish in my dad's aquarium have a choice over a range of anemones to go and live in. We haven't bought them all of these anemones. Anemones, once they get settled in a fish tank, will clone themselves. So all of the anemones that you can see in this video have cloned from one original specimen. And here is an example of the clownfish when they did lay eggs. You can see the bare patch of rock beneath the clownfish next to the anemone. That's the site that they've laid eggs on. And Mr. Clownfish is very diligently fanning oxygenated water over them. This again shows how well my dad looks after the fish in this tank. He provides the conditions for them to breed. And he also mentioned that one of the fish that was useful for keeping down unwanted algae was an algae blenny. And that's the fish at the front of this picture. And this algae blenny actually lasted for about four or five years. And he did an invaluable job of checking on the algae levels, turning the subdrake over and keeping the fish tank biologically active. So these types of fish with a particular role in the fish tank really help to keep it healthy. And again, in this photo, you can actually see another species of clownfish at the top of the picture, black with white stripes. You can keep more than one species of clownfish in an aquarium so long as there is sufficient space and so long as there are a sufficient number of anemones for them to set up their own territories within. But if you don't have space and you don't have enough anemones, then unfortunately your clownfish will fight and you're best to only keep one species. And as an example of things that turn up in the live rock, here are one of the tube worms that my dad was talking about. So this wasn't put in the fish tank. This has arrived naturally. It's still living and growing. It's come directly from the ocean from that live rock. And that live rock is sourced sustainably. It's a way of not damaging coral reefs. And again, it provides a useful service in the biological filtration of the tank. We just mentioned about the fish themselves and how they live and their different niches within the reef that they occupy 
and a knowledge of that means you can avoid competition. So, Alan, do you just want to talk a bit about the food that you provide the fish with and how often you feed them and what types of thing do they get? Okay, well, obviously, in the, in the wild, the, uh, the, the, the reef fish generally get around lots of small mollusks and crustaceans and things um, that are alive, obviously. Now, it's difficult to do that in a domestic situation, but what you can get is all sorts of different frozen food. Um, and that's an example of the frozen food there. And what makes it a marine mix? Well, it's a marine mix because it's got things that would normally be found in a reef environment. Things like brine shrimp, mysis shrimp, etc. Um, you could also have bits of um, uh, mussel and things like that in there, all of which. And each of them is a small cube of frozen food. Okay. Now, what I, what I do with that frozen food is I, I, I don't drop it in frozen. I let it thaw out before I put it into the fish tank. Okay. And then the other thing I do, because sometimes you, haven't, you maybe you haven't got the frozen food ready or whatever, or it's really run out, and I also do um, some dry pellet foods, which is just a mix, in the same way as you do sort of flake food for ordinary tropical fish. And they like that as well. It goes down quite well with them. And I guess the pelleted feed keeps its nutrient levels better over time than the frozen food. Yeah. So it's important to have a mix of both. They do have to have a mix. Um, and sometimes as well, it's a good idea to put some actual um, fresh greens in there, like lettuce and things like that, because um, they will have a go at that as well. Okay. Now, I've got a little bit of, 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 life, of, the, of the frozen food to put in the tank for them. Uh, I've already thawed it out, as you can see in the bottom of there. And all I do is I just add, a bit, add it to a bit of the water and then pour it in, and there they go. Now, some of the eagle-eyed in the audience might have noticed that some of your light is white and some of your light is blue. Why is there a difference? Well, it's just so that um, the blue light, when you get to the morning and the evening, you just have the blue light on for a little while so it simulates dawn and dusk and then the main lights come on so that the fish aren't suddenly you, you know how you'd be yourself if you were suddenly in a darkened room and somebody switched all the lights on you'd be blinded for a while the same thing would happen for the fish and bear in mind the fish haven't got any eyelids to close and when the anemones particularly go under the blue light, they fluoresce the most amazing green colour. They do, yes. Which, they all sorts of colours. Which is something that would happen in the wild when the sun goes down on the reef. Yeah. And happens of an evening when the blue light's on in here. One of the things that we've talked about a few times is the low stocking density of this fish tank. And that's characteristic of the fish themselves, but also of the uh, parameters of the water and keeping the water clean healthy and at the right mix for the fish. So Alan, do you just want to give a bit of a description of the size and volume of the tank and the ways in which you also help keep the water as clean as possible? Okay, well the fish tank is actually 360 litres in capacity, maximum size. It'll have a little bit less than that because obviously with all the rocks in there you lose some capacity. Um, it's 120 uh, centimetres long, it's 50 centimetres front to back and approximately 65 centimetres deep. Um, is that a, like a regular sized home aquarium? That is a, a bit of a larger size than perhaps most people would have in their, in their lounge, but it's not a bad size to have for a marine tank because it gives you a reasonable volume of water to keep that water stable over time. So the bigger the system for a marine aquarium, the better? Oh yeah, the best way you could do it is have a, a complete ocean. That would keep <laughs> everything nice and simple. One of the problem areas you do have with a smaller fish tank like this one is you can get outbreaks of disease, things like white spot and, and such like. In order to prevent that, what I've also got on here is a, a, a UV light, which is a, a, a special light which will sterilise the water as it's passed over it. So what I have is a small pump in the box in the corner of the tank 
it pumps the water slowly through the UV lamp and back into the other end of the tank as part of the circulation. So is that something that comes with the fish tank or you have to buy separately? No, I, I, it was bought separately and it's actually, it's uh, the UV lamp I use is actually one that's designed to go on a pond um, because it actually sits outside the tank and it's all sealed so no water can escape. And you mentioned a disease called white spot, so mm -hmm. is that exactly what it looks like on Precisely, the Precisely, it looks like they've been dusted with, with salt. So how does your UV lamp stop the fish from getting that disease? It zaps the white spot before <laughs> it can get at the fish. So it's a way of preventing a disease. It's a preventing, it's the same as you having an injection. You've got two pumps in the fish tank. So there's one just behind me and there's one over in that other corner. And um, what's the role of them for keeping the fish healthy? Well, obviously what you're trying to do here with those pumps because all they're doing is, is pumping water, they're not doing anything else, is you're trying to simulate the movement of the ocean. If you look at any natural reef where the waves are crashing against it, the water is being moved quite violently and quite rapidly all the time. Well, obviously you can't do exactly that in a fish tank, but you need to get the movement because you've got to make sure that the, the, the fresh oxygenated water is getting moved between all of the rocks around all of the sea anemones and that there are no stagnant areas in amongst all of that. And that's basically what the two pumps there and the single one over there, they're doing. They're making that movement of water. You could go to a, a next level up and actually program them so they blow one way part of the day and back the other way for the other part of the day, simulating the tidal movement of, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, the over the reef. But, I don't do that, I just have normal movement of water. And one of the things that's always important about a reef tank is a circular flow, which is why the two pumps are in either end. It washes everything over the live rock and the anemones. And the anemones particularly come out more when there's a, a more powerful flow of water. Well, thank you very much for talking about the fish. My pleasure. I hope everybody enjoyed that. So just a big thank you to my dad for giving up his time <laughs> to talk about clownfish and for giving you a live feeding demonstration. So thanks folks and I hope you found that useful.